Welcome to chapter 11 of Anatomy and Physiology, where we're going on to now the muscular system. In this chapter, we're really just looking at the muscular system macroscopically. Remember in chapter 10, we looked at it microscopically, looking at the cells, the mainly the skeletal muscle cells, and a little bit on cardiac and smooth. Well, now we're going into the macroscopic. Now we're going to look at skeletal muscles, the organs. Remember, these are skeletal muscles because they are uh, attached to your skeleton. That's why they're called skeletal muscle. And you remember, it's made up of skeletal muscle tissue, which is what you control. So this is the muscles, or these are the muscles that you're using to move and you control them. And they're helping you to move basically because they're pulling on your bones. And in order for muscles to pull on your bones, well, they need to attach to them. Oh, and you know the answer, like usual, you know the answer, way back from tissues. Remember, there is connective tissue that attaches muscle to bone. Remember, that connective tissue structure that attaches muscle to bone is a tendon. Make sure you know what a tendon does. A tendon attaches muscle to bone. And now you know really how everything works. You got to put it all together now. You know your skeletal muscles contract. They shorten. And when they shorten, they're going to pull on the tendon and that tendon will pull on the bone and you would see that as a movement. So that's how you're moving. And so when we look at all these skeletal muscles in this chapter, we're going to see them attached to bone. And a lot of them attach to bone in more than one place. They have more than one attachment. And in some cases, those attachments are to more than one bone. And you know, this is anatomy. So we're going to name everything. We even name where muscles attach. We give two names right off the bat. There's something called the origin and the insertion. There are both bony uh, attachments of muscle, but what's the difference? What's the difference between the origin and the insertion? Well, when you think about muscles attaching to bone, Usually there's a bone that's not going to move. It's going to hold everything in place. And when the muscle contracts, there will be a different bone that moves. These attachments are related to the origin and, and insertion. The origin is the muscle's attachment to the bone that does not move. The stationary bone is the bone that does not move. While the insertion is the muscle's attachment to the bone that does move, the movable bone. And you see in this picture here is an example showing your biceps muscle in the front and the triceps muscle in the back of the arm. Let's look at the biceps, the muscle in the front of the arm. Turns out it attaches to two bones. It attaches to the scapula higher up in the, in the arm and lower down it attaches to the radius bone. And so you could kind of think which one of these is the origin and which one's the insertion. Kind of think of working out your biceps. You know, when you work out your biceps, one way to do it is with a bicep curl. Lift up a dumbbell and raise it and drop it. Those are bicep curls. Well, think of what moves and doesn't move when you do the bicep curl. When you're working out your biceps in the gym, are you wiggling your shoulder to try to move the scapula? No. The bone that's moving is the bone in your forearm, the radius bone. So when you contract the biceps, the radius bone is going to move. So the radius bone is the insertion point. It's the movable bone. While your scapula, when you're moving the biceps or contracting the biceps, does not move. So the scapula is the origin. The scapula is the stationary bone. So a lot of muscles will have an origin, an attachment to a bone that does not move, and an insertion, an attachment to the bone that does move. And that bone that does move is kind of acting like a lever system. Your, your muscles kind of act like a pulley system or a lever system, like I mentioned. They're going to pull on the bones to help you to move. And when you move, you could move to lift something up. So kind of imagine having a big rock and taking a rope and tying the rope around the rock and then throwing the rope over a branch of a tree. That will make it a little bit easier to raise that rock when you're pulling it on the rope wrapped around the tree branch. That's kinda how your muscles work. They're pulling on your bones, which is representing the rock, and the tendons are like the rope helping to pull. It's a pulley system, a lever system. And again, these are just showing different types of pulley systems your muscles could do. Like usual, stick to the exam review.
So we're going to look at a lot of muscles in this chapter. And like usual, muscles, just like things like bones, will have lots of defining characteristics. There are some unique features to a lot of your uh, muscles. And one of these features is how the muscle cells are arranged. Remember, a fascicle is just a collection of muscle cells. And you remember, a fiber is just a synonym for muscle cell. So when we look at muscles, we can see how these fascicles, how these collections of muscle cells are arranged. And sometimes that will be represented in the name of the muscle. And we name these fascicle arrangements. You do not need to know these fascicle arrangement names for your exam. But like usual, I told you in anatomy, we name everything. For example, if all the cells in your fascicle are running in the same direction, aka running parallel to each other, well, we'll say this fascicle has a parallel arrangement. Or another example is if the cells kind of wrap around in a concentric circle, if they form a circle, where well, we're going to say that fascicle has a circular arrangement. So when we look at muscles, we'll see the fascicles. You'll literally see the cells running in a particular direction when we look at the muscle. But again, we're going to focus on the major muscles overall. And again, they're acting like pulley systems. And it turns out a lot of your muscles can actually help either help each other out or act against each other. And again, this is anatomy, so we're going to name everything. We give names to the different roles muscles can play when it comes to certain actions you want to do. There are certain names that you need to know the definition for. There's something called the agonist, or sometimes called the primary mover or prime mover. There's something called the agonist, something called the synergist. And if you're reading another textbook, they'll even name something called a fixator, F I X A. T O R. So what are these roles that these muscles could play? What are these definitions for these terms? For example, there's something called the agonist. When your muscle's an agonist, it means that it's doing the desired action. An agonist is a muscle that does the desired action. So for example, I might want to flex at my elbow. And to flex at my elbow is the job of my biceps. So when I want to flex at the elbow, my biceps is the agonist because it's doing my desired action. My biceps is helping me to flex at the elbow, which is what I want to do. So again, an agonist or a prime mover or primary mover does the desired action. And if there's a muscle that could do the desired action, well, there's possibly a muscle that could do the opposite of the desired action. That's what we call the antagonist. The antagonist does the opposite of the desired action. So again, let's take that example of me wanting to flex at my elbow. Well, again, you know the biceps will help me to flex at the elbow, so it's the agonist. Well, what's the opposite of flexing at the elbow? It's extending. And so there must be a muscle that helps me to extend at the elbow. And there is. It's the muscle in the back of your arm. It's called the triceps brachii. Your triceps allows you to extend at the elbow. And so if I'm trying to flex at the elbow, my triceps, it will do the opposite in that case. My triceps are the antagonist. So again, the antagonist does the opposite of the desired action. Keep going. There are more roles to play for muscles. Another role is something called the synergist. The synergist kind of gives you a hint in the name. Synergist for synergy, meaning working together. Turns out the synergist will help the agonist by removing unnecessary movements. That's the role of the synergist. It helps the agonist by removing unnecessary movements. And yet again, I'm using that biceps flex, or excuse me, using the elbow flexion example again. So if I want to flex at the elbow, all I want to do is flex at the elbow. I don't want to do any other unnecessary movements. When I'm trying to flex at my elbow, I don't want my forearm flying laterally or medially. I only want it to flex, not extend, not any other movement. And so to help my biceps do that, I have another muscle involved that will help to reduce unnecessary movements as I am flexing in the elbow. And that will be the job of the synergist. 
again, the synergist helps the agonist by removing unnecessary movement. And there's one more role uh, that some muscles could play. It's something called the fixator, F-I-X-A-T-O-R, the fixator. Again, it kind of gives you a hint in the name. It's called the fixator because it's fixing something, meaning it's holding something in place. Turns out, just like in real life, if I tried to move a heavy rock, and if I wasn't careful, if that rock were to slip and begin to roll as I'm holding on to the rope attached to it, I will get dragged with the rock also. Heavy loads could drag the person or thing trying to hold the load. So sometimes you need to be held in place. Your muscles are the same. Sometimes when you're trying to lift a heavy weight, if you're not careful, you could rip the muscle off the bone. It happens to some bodybuilders or heavy weight lifters. But hopefully that won't happen to you because you have a fixator. Some of your muscles have another muscle that will help to hold the agonist in place as you're doing the motion to help to hold or fix. To fix means to hold it in place. That's the job of the fixator. So those are different roles muscles could play. Make sure you know the definitions one more time. An agonist or prime mover or primary mover does the desired action. The antagonist does the opposite of the desired action. The synergist removes unnecessary movements to help the agonist. And the fixator will hold or fix the agonist in place. So make sure you know those roles of different muscles. So from here on out, we're going to begin to explore different muscles in your body. Like usual, they're going to have some weird names. But like I always tell you, never be intimidated by names. Their names are always here to help. And like usual, their names are giving you hints. For a lot of these names, they can literally tell you where to find the muscle in the name. Or maybe the name is telling you if that muscle is big or small or long or short. Sometimes if a muscle is long, it will have the word longest in the name. Or if it's short, it will have the word brevis in the name because brevis means short. Or maybe it's telling you where it attaches. For example, you'll see there's a muscle called your sternocleidomastoid. It's really telling you its insertion and origin point. It's called sterno because part of it attaches to the sterno, sternum. Sorry, Cleido or clido for clavicle because it also par partly attaches to the clavo, clavicle. And it ends with the word mastoid because it attaches also partly to your mastoid process. So its name literally told you exactly where to find it because it was telling you where that muscle was attaching. So like usual, as we go through these muscles, we're not going to go through all of them. We'll pick out as much as possible, but we'll, we're going to kind of look at them. Their names will give you hints as to what it's doing or where you could find it. And in this chart on table 11.2, it's giving you these name breakdowns. Like I always usually do. I try to break down names for you to help it make more sense. Well, this table 11.2 is helping to do the same thing. It's just breaking down the names to show you their meaning to help you to either locate it or learn something about that muscle. And you know, like always, stick to the exam review. Right now, we're just going to go through some of the muscles in the body kind of point them out to you and then talk about what these muscles do. You're going to have to know the function of several muscles listed in your exam review. I'm going to go through several, several as I'm going through this lecture, but just make sure you stick to the exam review. And I'm just going to start from the top of the body and we're going to work our way down. And we're going to start in the head and in the face. Turns out in the head and the face, you have several different muscles, each doing a different specific function to help you to move or express yourself in some type of manner. And so we could look at this picture here of a person's face in the cartoon. And you can see over the forehead, it's a small muscle. It's called the occipital frontalis muscle, sometimes called the epicranius muscle. This muscle 
partly, lots of these muscles have lots of functions. I'm just going to mention one. And I, when I'm mentioning the functions, I'm going to give you the anatomical definitions, which kind of might seem kind of strange when we talk about it, but it will make sense as we go through it. So back to this occipital frontalis. This muscle, as one of its functions, can elevate the eyebrows. Oh, what does it mean to elevate the eyebrows? It's when you raise your eyebrows and give someone that creepy, hey, what's up? You're using your occipital frontalis muscle. It can help to elevate the eyebrows. Keep going. You have a circular muscle that r seems to wrap around the eye. It's this circular muscle around the eye. We call it the or orbicularis oculi. Again, don't be intimidated by names. Just break it down. It's called orb because it's circular, kind of like an orb. And the oculi is for oculus, which means eye. So its name is literally meaning a circular muscle around the eye. And it has one job. Its one job is to help you to close your eye. That's it. It only closes the eye. That's why if you close your eyes really tight, you'll feel the muscle tense up in a circle around your eye. But if you relax it, you'll notice your eyes are still closed because it's actually a different muscle that help you to open your eyes. It's a tiny muscle embedded in your eyelid. We call the levator palpebrae su superioris muscle. This helps you to open the eye. But to close the eye is the job of the orbicularis oculi. If you notice in the face still, there's another circular muscle here. There's another circular muscle that wraps around the lips, around the mouth. It's called the orbicularis oris. Again, orb in orbicularis because it's circular. And in this case, it's called oris for your oral region, which is your mouth. So again, its name literally tells you where to find it. Orbicularis oris is a circular muscle around the mouth. And in this case, it's helping you to close the mouth or in some cases, purse the lips. You purse your lips when you drink from a straw or when, you, you, when you're whistling, or when you're about to kiss, you're pursing your lips. That's the job of your orbicularis oris. Keep going, lots of muscles in the face. If you notice, there are two skinny little muscles kind of running at an angle towards the corner of the mouth. There's something called the zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor. The zygomaticus minor We'll have minor in the name because it's the smaller one and major is the slightly bigger one. And they're both your zygomaticus muscle, zygomaticus major and minor. And they kind of give you a hint as to their action based off the direction they're running. They're running towards the corner of the mouth. So when this muscle contracts, its function is to elevate the corners of the mouth. Oh, what, what do you think you're doing when you elevate the corners of the mouth? Well, it's called a smile. Remember, I have to give you anatomical definitions. So simply, your zygomaticus major and minor help you to smile, but technically, if I were to ask on your exam, say that it helps to elevate the corners of the mouth. Keep going. Lots of muscles still in the face. You even have a little muscle over the chin. Remember, your chin area is called your mental region. So this small muscle sitting over your mental region is called your mentalis muscle. Mentalis muscle. It's partially able to help depress the lower lip, meaning help you to lower your lower lip. But you can also use it to wrinkle your chin. Little babies, whenever they get upset, they always wrinkle their little little chins. Turns out babies are masters of using their mentalis muscle. They'll wrinkle their little baby chins. But anywho, back to muscles. <clears throat> Keep going, lots of muscles in the face. There's a deep muscle in the face buried under several other muscles. It's called your buccinator muscle, buccinator. It's called buccinator for buckle, which means cheeks. This is the muscles in your cheeks. And your buccinator muscle's job is to expel contents from the oral cavity. Uh-oh, what does that mean? To expel contents from the oral cavity is simply spitting. When you spit, well, that's you expelling or kicking out something from your mouth, from your oral cavity. And you could partially help to do that with your buccinator muscle. 
Keep going, lots of muscles still in the face. Go back up towards the head. You saw the uh, occipital frontalis muscle well, off to the sides of the head, kind of sitting on top of your temporal bone is something called your temporalis muscle. Turns out this muscle will work in a group. Sometimes a lot of your muscles work together. And this one is part of a group that we call your muscles of mastication. Oh, what does it mean to masticate? To masticate means to chew. So your temporalis muscle with a couple other muscles will help you to chew. I want you to know two of your muscles of mastication. One of them is the temporalis muscle. So if you were to put your hands on the sides of your head, kind of right above the ear, you'll feel it contract as you're chewing because it's helping you to chew. And continue to chew and now move your hands down into the face. Where else do you feel it bulge? Well, you'll feel it bulge, muscles bulge, over the jaw. If you notice over the jaw, there's a huge muscle. We call it the masseter muscle. It sits over the jaw. It's a powerful masticating muscle. So make sure you know these two muscles of mastication. On the side of the head, sitting over the temporal bone, is the temporalis muscle. And sitting on the jaw is a large muscle called the masseter muscle. Those are two of your muscles of mastication. Those are two muscles that help you to chew. Also on this side view of the face, we could see some of the neck. Turns out there's a big superficial muscle over the front or anterior portion of the neck. It's very wide, but it's actually paper thin. It's a super thin muscle over the front of the neck. We call it the platysma muscle, platysma. When you flex this muscle, it makes the neck look a little bit wider. We say in anatomy, it helps you to grimace. When you grimace, it's gonna sound weird, but kind of think being constipated on the toilet and you're straining. Whenever you're straining, uh oh, that's a grimace. Your neck might get a little wider. You're just seeing the roll or the actions of your platysma muscle. And if you were to peel off the pl platysma muscle, you'll notice that there are muscles underneath it. And you'll see this throughout the body. There are muscles on top of muscles. You saw the buccinator is buried under other muscles. Turns out there are muscles buried underneath the platysma. And one of those muscles buried on the, under the platysma is a muscle I mentioned earlier. Don't be intimidated by the name. It's called the sternocleidomastoid. Remember, don't be intimidated. Remember, it told you exactly where to find it. Remember, it's called sterno because it partly attaches to the sternum. It's called clido because it's partly attached to the clavicle towards the front of the chest. And it's called mastoid because it attaches to the mastoid process behind the ear. And that's what you see. It's this long, skinny, cylindrical muscle running from behind the ear towards the front of the neck at the top of the chest. That's your sternocleidomastoid. You have one for each side of your neck. Why? Because you remember, you have two mastoid processes, one for each of your temporal bones. Remember, you have two temporal bones, one for each side of your head. So you're going to have two sternocleidomastoid muscles, one for each side of your neck. And what does this muscle do? Well, simply it helps you to turn the head, to rotate the head. But you got to know a specific definition. It helps you specifically to turn the head to the opposite side, meaning your right sternocleidomastoid will turn the head to the left, and your left sternocleidomastoid will turn the head to the right. So they're, they're pretty much turning the head in the opposite direction it's located. And you can feel this when you put your hands on your neck and just turn, you'll feel the neck tense up on the opposite side of the turn. That's your sternocleidomastoid. And that's all the muscles we're really going to explore in the head and the neck. So we're going to go down a little bit into the torso. When we come down into the torso, again, we're going to see several different muscles here. And like the head and neck, there will be muscles buried underneath other muscles. So we're going to take our time. We're going to kind of try to peel through these different layers. And talk about some of these muscles, and like usual, stick to the exam review. 
So we're gonna start off up in the chest. In your chest, you have this big fan-like muscle right in the anterior superficial portion of the chest. It's called the pectoralis major. And if you were to rip off the pectoralis major, there will be a smaller pectoralis minor. It's kind of like the zygomaticus major and minor. The majors are always the bigger ones and the minors are the smaller ones in humans. And so you have this pectoralis major and minor. And they both have the same names, at least the first part, because they're pretty much doing the same thing as at least one similar function. And you might know if you know how to get bigger pecs in the gym. Uh, what do you do in the gym to get bigger pecs? Well, you go and you do push-ups or you go and you do, uh, you sit on the bench and you or you do flies at the gym. You're trying to do something mainly actually with your arms. It's actually in the arm and shoulder is how this muscle works. Its function is to help do arm extension. So when you are just on the ground doing push-ups, you're basically extending the arm over and over again. And that's the job of your pectoralis major muscle. So we'll get worked out and it will hypertrophy and get bigger. So that's the pectoralis major. If you want bigger pecs in the chest, do push-ups, do flies in the gym. <clears throat> Keep going, come down uh, or look between the ribs. You can see the ribs over on the right side on this image. On this image, like a lot of the other images, on one side they'll sh show superficial muscles and on the other side they've ripped off the superficial muscles so you can see muscles underneath. So on the right side, we can see the ribs and we can see that there are muscles between the ribs. And we name these muscles between the ribs. They're called your intercostal muscles. And your intercostal muscles are actually helping you to breathe. How? They help you to expand your rib cage for breathing to help the diaphragm, which is the major muscle for breathing. So when you actually eat ribs, you're actually technically eating that animal's internal and external intercostal muscles. Their rib muscles they were using to help their diaphragm to help them to breathe. But anywho, back to the muscles. Going down now into the abdomen, to where people talk about having abs. Everyone talks about having abs. And when we talk about abs, people talk about having a four pack, a six pack, a eight pack. I've even seen a creepy 10 pack. What's going on here? Is this muscle, your abs, really five or six or 10 different packs of muscles? Actually, no. It's one large sheet of muscle we call the rectus abdominis. That's where you get abs from. You're actually saying part of the name. It's called the rectus abdominis. And it's a large muscle covering the anterior portions of the abdomen. So how do you get the packs? How do you get it broken up like that? Well, you kind of see a hint in the picture. There is lots of connective tissue that attaches and runs through this muscle. It's all the white you're seeing here. And some of this white is running through like little lines, like this one going right down the middle of the rectus abdominis. It's called the linea alba. The linea alba is just connective tissue running vertically down the middle of the rectus abdominis. But if anything, that just breaks your rectus abdominis up into a two pack, into a left and right. So how do you get more packs? Oh, well, you see more connective tissue in the picture. It's running horizontally. These little white little horizontal lines are what we call tendinous insertions. And they're pretty much just like the linea alba. They're just connective tissue running through the muscle. And this kind of breaks up the muscle into these little pouches we call packs. So turns out the number of tendinous insertions you have can vary. And it'll only vary based off your genetics. So if the best your parents could do is a four pack, well, odds are that's the best you could do too. Why is that important? Because maybe you might want to become a, a personal trainer and you're probably trying to help someone to get six pack abs. And for the life of you, all you can manage to get them is a four pack and they're getting mad at you. Well, you might need to tell them to chill. Maybe they only have two tendon or one tendinous insertion breaking up their rectus abdominis into a four pack. So knowing anatomy like usual helps.
And then now that we know where this muscle is and what it looks like, oh, how does it work? What's the function? Like usual, you might know. How do you try to work out your abs? Well, you do sit-ups or you do planks huh. or you do crunches. What are you doing when you do sit-ups and crunches? Remember, I got to give you anatomical definition. So again, this might sound weird. Turns out the job of your rectus abdominis is to flex the spine flex the spine. You flex the spine every time you take a bow or when you do a sit up or when you do a crunch. So when you want to work out your rectus abdominis, you just flex the spine over and over again. Do sit ups or do crunches over and over again. That's one function. What else? Look at other muscles in the abdomen. Look, look more onto the sides of the torso. On the sides of your torso are what we call your oblique muscles. You have two of them. There's an external oblique, which is more superficial. And if we were to peel it back and look underneath it, deep to it, we'll see the internal oblique. Remember their names tell you. There's the external oblique, because it's more external, it's more superficial. So you see it off to the left-hand side on the superficial side. And you, you can kind of tell this muscle based off how the fibers are running. You kind of see these grooves look, look, it looks like grooves in the muscle in the cartoon. They're actually trying to show you that fascicle arrangement like we talked about earlier. They're trying to show you the direction the fascicles and the cells are running in the muscle. And when you look at the external oblique, you notice it looks like the muscle is running down towards the middle of the body, almost like it's running down towards the belly button, like you're putting your hand in a hoodie pocket. That's the direction your external obliques run, kind of down towards the middle. And if you were to peel it off and look underneath, which is what you see on the right-hand side, there's the internal obliques. These run in a different direction. They run down towards the hip and back. Internal oblique fibers run down towards the hip and back. So you, one way to tell them is the level, are you the superficial one, external, or the deeper one, internal, or which way is the fibers running? Is it running down towards the middle front of the abdomen? external or down towards the hip and back internal and they're both called obliques because they could both do some of the same functions and like usual i'll give you one and like usual you might know if you go to the gym to work out if you want to work out your obliques you do those side bends those side crunches oh what do, what do you call it in anatomy when you bend to the side either left or right we call that laterally flexing the spine your external and your internal obliques help to laterally extend the spine. Oh, sorry, laterally flex the spine, not extend. Your internal and external obliques help to laterally flex the spine, meaning bend to the side. So those are some of the muscles in your torso and the abdomen. Now we're coming down into the, into the lower limb, starting off in the thigh. And like usual, again, there are lots of muscles and lots of muscles are buried underneath other muscles. And this is true for not only the front of the thigh, but also the back of the thigh and the medial and lateral aspects. So we, when we look at the thigh, we break it up into four areas. The front of the thigh, anterior compartment, the back of the thigh, posterior compartment, the pinky toe side of the thigh, that's the lateral compartment, and the big toe side of the thigh, that's the medial compartment. So we're gonna look at the thigh based off those four regions, front, back, medial, and lateral. And we're gonna start off in the front, which you can see in this picture here. Turns out when you look in the front of the thigh, there's one muscle that's very superficial. It's a skinny snake-like muscle that seems to wrap around the front of the thigh. We call that muscle the sartorius muscle, the sartorius. This muscle, helps you to rotate the thigh, rotate, a kind of a turning motion, just like in the head. You could rotate the thigh with your sartorius. And if we were to peel this off, there's going to be at least four muscles underneath the sartorius. And these four muscles are going to work together, so we're going to group them up. These four muscles form a group we call the quadriceps femoris. We might normally know them as the quads. When people say they're quads, the full name is the quadriceps femoris. 
And it's called quad for four because it's technically four individual muscles that happen to work together. What are the four muscles of the quadriceps femoris? Well, there's something called the rectus femoris, the vastus intermedius, the vastus lateralis, and the vastus medialis. Those four muscles form your quadriceps femoris. Rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, and the vastus medialis. Again, don't be intimidated. They tell you where to find them. Okay. So first off, we start off with the rectus femoris. This, it's an oval-shaped muscle right in the middle of the anterior portion of the thigh. That's the rectus femoris. And if you were to go medial to it, go big toe side, there's a muscle that's medial to the rectus femoris. We call that the vastus medialis, tells you in the name. And there's a muscle pinky toe side to the rectus femoris. There's a muscle lateral to the rectus femoris. We call that the vastus lateralis. And there's one more. It's the vastus intermedius. This muscle is deep to the rectus femoris. So you would have to cut through the rectus femoris, lift it up, and you would see a muscle still underneath it. That's the vastus intermedius. That's what you see in this picture. They've cut through or re removed a section of the rectus femoris so you can see the vastus intermedius below it. All four of these muscles are your quadriceps femoris. Why? Because they do the same thing. What's the function of the quadriceps femoris? What's the function of the rectus femoris, vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and vastus intermedius? It helps you to extend at the knee. When you do knee extension, that's the job of your quadriceps femoris muscles. That's why when you go to the gym, if you want to work out your quads, you go sit in that machine and you kick out over and over again. That's you extending at the knee because that's the job of your quadriceps femoris. Keep going. Now we're going to look at the uh, medial part of the thigh. When you look at the medial part of the thigh, there's a muscle that's running straight up and down in the medial aspect of the thigh. It's called the gracilis muscle, gracilis. And around it are a couple of other muscles that all have adductor in the name, something called the adductor longus, adductor magnus, etc. These adductors and the gracilis muscle do the same thing. They're all located in the medial compartment. Think inner thigh, big toe side. And the adductors give you a hint in the name as to what all the adductors do and the gracilis. They all do adduction. Remember, to adduct is to bring towards the body or towards the midline. This is how you're going to be able to bring the legs together. When you bring your legs together, you're adducting them. You're using the adductors and the gracilis in the thigh to help you to adduct the thigh. <clears throat> now we're going to look in the back. If you look in the back of your hip and thigh, well, there's your butt. Turns out your butt is actually mainly muscle. A large group of muscles we call your gluteal muscles. There are three major muscles that form your butt. There's the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and something called the gluteus minimus. They're all your butt muscles. And like usual, they give you a hint of the name. When you look at the butt, if you were to look at these muscles from superficial to deep, the most superficial one is actually the biggest of all three. It's the gluteus maximus. It's called maximus because it's the biggest. And if you were to peel back or reflect back the gluteus maximus, you'll see the kind of in the middle in terms of size, the gluteus medius gluteus medius and the smaller gluteus minimus and they're all gluteal muscles so they're all going to do the same thing and like usual you might know if you work out at the gym or in this case if you go to instagram why what's everybody doing on instagram they're trying to show you how to get a big butt and how do they do it it's squats ah but what part of the squat is the job of your butt what part of the squat is the job of the gluteal muscles gluteus maximus medius and minimus it's not getting into the squat. It's not squatting down. It's actually when you get out of the squat. It's the getting up. When you get up out of a squat, that's something happening in your hip. It's called hip extension. Kind of thing. When you go to sit in a chair, that's you flexing at a hip. And when you get out of the chair, that's you extending at the hip. And that's the job of your butt. 
So if you want a bigger butt, there's no worries. Just go work out your gluteal muscles. What do you need to do? You need to get out of a squat over and over again. Or you have another option. You also extend at the hip when you climb the stairs. That's why if you also want bigger butts, you could just use the Stairmaster and climb stairs all day, every day, because you're gonna do a hip extension every time you climb up that stair. So that's how you're gonna work out these gluteal muscles. Why? Because they help with hip extension. Again, going further down now, back into the thigh. Now we're looking at the back of the thigh. And just how you saw there were groups of muscles in the front of the thigh, there are also groups of muscles in the back of the thigh. And one group of muscles in the back of the thigh are what we call your hamstrings, hamstrings. Your hamstrings are actually three muscles that work together. And you can see them in the back of the thigh. Two of them are located more medially and one of them is located more uh, isolated laterally. So when you look at the back of the thigh, Pinky toe side, lateral side, will be one long muscle by itself. That's the biceps femoris. That's one of your hamstring muscles. And then big toe side, medial side, are two muscles. One is sitting on top of the other. The superficial one is very skinny. We call it the semitendinosus because it has a long tendon. And it's sitting on top of a wider muscle called the semimembranosus. All three of these muscles are your hamstrings. It's the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. And when it comes to your lab exam, I know this is lecture, but just to give a hint now, when it comes to your lab exam, like usual, you need to spell out the full names of things. And in this case, it's gonna be important. Why? Because you see now a couple muscles have some similar parts to your names. You've seen at least two muscles now that have the word bicep in the name. There's the biceps brachii in the, in the arm, helping you to flex at the elbow. And now you're seeing something called the biceps femoris, which is one of your hamstring muscles in the back of the thigh. So if you write biceps, I technically don't know which one you're refer, referring to. Or even the last part of biceps femoris. You saw on the front of the thigh, there's the rectus femoris for femur. And in the back of the thigh, there's the biceps femoris. Again, named after the femur. So in now, again, in this case, if you just write femoris, I don't know if you're talking about the muscle in the front of the thigh or the muscle in the back. So like usual, on your exam, when you get there, when it comes to naming muscles, try your best to put the full name. That way you won't confuse it, or at least I won't confuse it with any other muscle name or other muscle that has a similar part to the name. But back to your hamstrings. So you now know the three muscles in the hamstrings. Again, biceps femoris, semimembranosus, and semitendinosus. And they're all the hamstrings because they all do the same thing. And it turns out your hamstrings do the opposite of the quadriceps femoris. Remember, your quadriceps allowed you to extend at the knee. Kind of think when you kick out, that's extending at the knee. So your hamstrings are going to flex at the knee. You flex the knee. Think when you're running, you need to flex at the knee. This is why runners are always pulling the hamstrings because to run, you need to flex at the knee and you might overwork these muscles and cause a strain. So those are muscles that can help to flex and extend the knee. One more time, helping with knee extension, quadriceps femoris, and helping with knee flexion or your hamstrings. Just going to mention a couple more muscles and then we'll stop. Coming down now into the legs, again, lots of muscles and again, muscles on top of muscles. When it comes to your lecture exam, stick to the exam review. I'll only ask about the muscles in your exam review. But now we're coming down into the leg. And in the leg, like usual, there are several muscles. I'm going to mention a couple. For example, in the front of the leg, right next to your shin bone, your tibia bone, in the front of the leg is something called the tibialis anterior. Again, don't be intimidated by the name. It's called tibialis because it's touching the tibia and anterior because it's right in the front of the leg. This muscle helps you to dorsiflex. Oh, remember, what is dorsiflexion? Remember, dorsiflexion is when you put toes up, heels down. You're able to pull those toes up with your tibialis anterior. So it helps with dorsiflexion. 
And if there's a muscle for dorsiflexion, well, there must be a muscle that does the opposite, plantar flexion. Turns out that's the job of the muscle in your calf. Turns out your calf in the back of your leg is actually two muscles, one sitting on top of the other. The bigger, more superficial muscle is called the gastrocnemius, and it's sitting on top of the soleus muscle. Your gastrocnemius and your soleus muscles are both forming your calf, and they are both helping you to plantar flex. They help you to tiptoe. They help you to put toes down, heels up. So those are just a couple of the muscles located in the leg. And then to finish off this chapter, we talk about when some things go wrong. Okay, And when some things go wrong, we're just talking about muscles. And usually it's things like a strain. You strain muscles. Think you sprain joints, but you strain muscles. And strains typically occur in people who are very active. So think athletes. Some like runners. I mentioned runners do things like strain their hamstrings. And whenever you strain a muscle, you might know how to help treat it. One thing is you're going to have to help kill some pain. That's the job of things like NSAIDs. Think Tylenol. If it's a chronic pain, you might need things like steroid injections. If it's a serious strain, you might need to do some rehabilitation, some rehab, some physical therapy, might need to ice it, um, elevate the, the, the strain of muscle to help rehab it. But you want to focus on specific, more, more urgent injuries than a strain. There's something called compartment syndrome. I want you to know what is compartment syndrome. You see this usually in things like crush injuries to muscle. Kind of think if you were to get your leg pinned underneath a car or a motorcycle. That's a crush injury. This, this might generate a compartment syndrome. What's happening here? In compartment syndrome, you damage not only muscle, but also blood vessels. And the blood is going to leak out. But the skin is still intact, so the blood has nowhere to go. It's going to stay in that area. It's going to stay in that compartment and begin to squeeze surrounding structures, like muscles or even nerves. This is compartment syndrome. It's when blood compresses structures within a compartment, within an area. We saw things like the thigh gets broken up into compartments, anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral. If you were to have a crush injury to the anterior part of your thigh, you might get a compartment syndrome in the anterior part of your thigh where blood will crush not only the muscles but also blood vessels because the blood can't get out. So how do you treat it? Uh, You've probably seen it on TV. It's not going to be pretty. You're going to have to drain that blood out in an emergent situation. You're going to have to cut that person open and allow the blood to ooze out so that it's no longer basically strangling the structures in that compartment. So that's compartment syndrome. When blood vessels break, blood leaks out and crushes structures in the compartment. And this could lead to things like paralysis, if you crush and damage the nerves too much, or paresthesia, meaning you become numb, or also pain as well. Pain or num- and or numbness could occur. So that's compartment syndrome. You gotta drain out the blood. And then to finish off this chapter, we look at one more thing that could go wrong. It's something called plantar fasciitis. You see this a lot in runners. Plantar fasciitis kind of gives you a name in the in the a hint in the name. Plantar. Remember your plantar region is the bottom of the foot. So this is something going on in the po- bottom of the foot. Think the sole of the foot. Fasciitis is for fascia which is connective tissue, and itis is inflammation. So if you broke down the name, it literally tells you what's going on. It's inflammation occurring in connective tissues in the bottom of the foot, the sole of the foot. And this could be painful. It's due to chronic irritation. I told you this is in runners. When you run, you're stressing out not only the muscles in your feet, the bones in your feet, but also connective tissue in the feet. And we name this one sheet of connective tissue located on the bottom of your foot. It's called your plantar aponeurosis. This is just the name to the connective tissue sheet along the bottom of the foot. It's deep in, in, in the foot, deep to the, your skin. 
And when you run, it gets irritated and it becomes painful. And we call that plantar fasciitis. And it's easy to treat. You're just kind of irritating it. It's an inflammation problem. So you want to do things very similar to a strained muscle. You want to take your NSAIDs, take your Tylenol. You want to ice it. You want to elevate it. If you need to walk, you can have a prosthetic, but don't think fake foot. This prosthetic is more of a boot. You want to wear a hard-soled shoe. Think a boot. If you see someone with a boot on, they might have plantar fasciitis, or they'll just be wearing hard-soled shoes. Okay. Shoes with a hard bottom, a flat hard bottom. Those are hard-soled shoes. And again, if it's a chronic problem, having it for a long time, again, those steroid injections might work. Or in extreme cases, they'll have surgery where they'll kind of cut through the aponeurosis to loosen it up a bit or partially remove it. So that's plantar fasciitis. It's just inflammation of the connective tissue plantar aponeurosis on the bottom of the foot, usually due to chronic overuse. Think running. How do you treat it? Ice it, elevate it, take your NSAIDs, your Tylenol. In extreme cases, you might want to have steroid injections or therapy or wear your boot, your prosthetic. So that's a little bit on muscles, the organs, and that's chapter 11.